my counselor on this, and uh, so you can blame him. It's his fault. <laughs> he was the one that encouraged me to put this together, and we have lost the uh, amplification here. It comes and goes, huh? Yeah. Kind of like democracy in this country. <laughs> But that's the last thing I'm going to say about living on Earth because my remarks today are as a citizen of this country. And I'm not here as a journalist. I'm not here to fairly balance the story. <laughs> I'm here to tell it like it is. <laughs> because if you don't do come on, man, they cut me off already. As soon as I can't believe this. Let's try this up one here. Do you think this will be? Let's see. How about this? Yeah. All right? For now, anyway, maybe if I say something else, they won't move. <laughs> this notion of leaving it in the ground is a really powerful one. Um, even President Obama the other day, when he was saying goodbye, Keystone, for now, um, said that uh, we need to keep it in, at least keep some of it in the ground. Notice he didn't give us a percentage. But let's do the math. There was a, Jim Hansen was here, he didn't mention that he got arrested in the White House uh, protesting Keystone. And in September, there was some activists who went to the White House. They didn't get arrested that day, but they, they started to protest the federal government's leasing for fossil fuel extraction on the land and, in, of course, in, in government waters offshore. And here's some of the math that they had that day. They pointed out that the president's clean power plan, which has got, you know, the coal industry just like, oh my god, well, this is just really horrible, got them all upset, would sequester about six, um, whoa, would sequester about six gigatons of carbon. Now, six gigatons of carbon is actually a really interesting number because every year around the world, um, we seem to be adding about six gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere. We are burning maybe about eight or nine. If Jim is still here, maybe you can correct me on the numbers. So, um, six gigatons of carbon would be all, you know, most of the world's carbon emissions for a year, just from this plan to uh, have the uh, coal-fired power stations uh, get cleaned up, right? That's a pretty good number, right? Almost a year's worth of emissions. Okay, um, class, how many gigatons of coal are on public land in the United States or offshore or under the sea? Anybody know? Quite a few. This man in the front row, he knows. Actually, the number is about 450 gigatons. 450. Let me put those into perspective for you. Um, you know, the Earth breathes. So, when it's summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, there's about 600 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. And when it's wintertime, when the leaves have fallen and they're oxidized, it goes to about 700. So, 450 gigatons of carbon is more than half of the CO2 in the atmosphere today. Just on America's public lands and under America's public waters. So if that is kept in the ground, but of course it's not kept in the ground today, is it? Oh, I'm saying the wrong things. They seem to be messing with the sound again. Oh, you got it, we got it. Is it better? So why would we take that stuff out? Why would we burn it? And by the way, we sell it below cost. If you go out to the Powder Ridge, Powder Ridge uh, uh, River Basin in, in Wyoming, where the coal is being extracted, um, on behalf of us, well, I don't know, is there somebody here who's not a United States citizen? Okay, all right. You, you, you two folks, you're not getting ripped off. The rest of us are. Because the government actually sells that coal, allows it to be leased really well below the cost. I mean, we're talking about monetary cost, not the ecological cost. I mean, because, well, if we put that in, it's just ridiculous. And, uh, of course, there have been plans to try to export that coal to the Far East because, you know, the coal business in America is going down. I think the more than 200 coal-fired power plants have 
come offline in, in fairly recent times. So isn't that pretty amazing? So why do we need to extract that? I want to I want to take you back in history a little bit, because I think it can give us a perspective about why we're in this kind of trouble. I, maybe this phasing is from being back here. I, I, I can't tell. Um, maybe over here it's a little better. The sound system likes it a little bit. Okay. Maybe it likes it a little better. Here. Yeah? Okay. Good to go. Let's, a little bit of history. I think there's an analogy to today's times to slavery in this country. Why? A couple of reasons. First, the obvious one, but especially what Fred spoke to, is the moral question. You know, back then we actually thought that we could own somebody else and buy and sell them. Family connections be damned. Their lives be damned, you know, with money. It was just a tradable commodity, a person, a horse, a house, bought and sold. Big signs, actually, throughout the South. Uh, Negroes for sale. That was ridiculously immoral. And what we're doing to the climate is ridiculously immoral. But the reason I bring it up is the economic model that it tells us about. A little bit of economic history now. In around 1820 or so in America, about a third of Southerners owned slaves, though most slave owners just had four or five, between about 1820, 1830, and 1860, the price of slaves quadrupled. Quadrupled. And the people owning slaves pretty much came down to 4% of the southern population. Sound like anything familiar today? <laughs> What's more, Slaves, people, Negroes became a commodity of speculation. And the actual cash value of the slave population in the South was greater than the cash value of the land. So there was a problem, though. When you have a speculative bubble like that, you have to keep going. So as I've understood this history, this is why there's such a fight over to have more and more territory be slave because you needed some place to send those slaves. And it became a business, the breeding of slaves became a really lucrative business. The mythology of slaveholding, by the way, was as it you know, the darkies are part of the family, we don't sell them, we're really benevolent, blah, 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 blah. What was the word that uh, Professor Hansen used? Oh, bullshit, that's it. <laughs> but here's another problem economically. So by the time it gets to be the big plantation holders who have the vast majority of slaves, as we approach 1860, and we all know what's going to happen next class, those plantation owners throughout the South sat in the legislature. You had the big plantation, you pretty much had the county. Or maybe it was a really big county, maybe two of you had the county. So you, you know, if you're in Georgia, you're off to the state house in Georgia. If you're in Alabama, you're off to the state house in Alabama. So the representatives, the people in the government, were from that class, that 4% at the end. Uh, so, uh, and then maybe to bring it up to today's times, that valuable slave towards the end of the speculation in today's dollars is probably $60,000, right? Prime, male, slave. Uh, there were some slaves, by the way, in the horse training business who would sell for ridiculous amounts of money, uh, half a million, the equivalent of quarter million dollars today, half a million dollars. But for your sort of average, prime, working, really great, it's like at the end of the speculative bubble was $60,000. The South could not unwind itself from this economic mess. The North had figured out, all right, we're going to go to free labor, we'll separate ownership of people from working, and started a market economy. The South got into the market economy, but they got into speculation, speculation about people. 
So what do we have today with fossil fuel? It's inextricably tied up in our economy in all kinds of ways. It's easy to point to, somebody said the Koch brothers, yeah, I mean, how do they make their dough? It's fossil fuel business. And they're part of that, well, we call it the 1% today. But everybody is hooked into this system, the expansion of it. Uh, Fred uh, called me a little embarrassed on the way to our gathering. Steve, I'm stuck in traffic. Why was he stuck in traffic? Because we keep making more and more cars. Why do we keep making more and more cars? Because just like you have to have more and more places to sell slaves, you gotta keep making more and more, uh, to, to, have, to grow cotton, you gotta keep making more and more cars so that GM and the industries that have built up can keep expanding. And of course, where do all the cars go? They go right in front of you when you're in traffic, right? <laughs> So the moral of this story, folks, is that we didn't get out of this box with slavery in America in a very elegant way. The equivalent of six million people died in that war, if it was today. It's horrible. The South maybe kind of, sort of, has recovered from the economic meltdown there. I mean, one day you're worth zillions of dollars with these slaves and the war goes through and you've got nothing. So I think we can do better this time. Recognizing that this is an economic conundrum. There's some great solutions that have been put forward. Um, you know, I'll be a good guest. And I'll say that uh, certainly one way forward is a revenue neutral dividend program. There are other ways forward. But I want to remind folks that the North, in responding to the evils of the slave trade and slavery and the banning of the trade from Africa, extricated itself from this insanity on the basis of morality. People stood up and said, this is wrong, we should not be doing this, let's stop. And we did. Yeah, okay. I live in a house not far from the seacoast of New Hampshire. It was built in 1755 or so, and the records show that uh, the owner, his name was Bob Leathers, had a slave, his name was Caesar. I like to say, I'm back! <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about it, is that my town, my state, this region, smelled the coffee, whatever it is, and got out of the game. Got out of it. And didn't wait for the economic meltdown. So when I hear people talk about, well, there's an economic solution, there's a market-based solution to this problem, um, you know, I remember about the time that Jim was in front of Al Gore and that committee, Al Gore, and in the process of the uh, Kyoto negotiations, we, the United States, pushed this cap, cap and trade program on Europe, you know. The Europeans wanted to have flat limits, each country. We said, no, 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 we should be able to trade. And then, of course, we reneged on the whole deal. But we came up with this line that economically we could make this happen. I have my doubts that we can sufficiently motivate America and the world to act without looking at the moral basis of what we are doing. It is wrong to enslave nature. It is wrong to destroy the future of our children. It is wrong to, 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 to so disrespect the creation that our God has given us. Now here's the thing. That same God gives us love gives us the power to appreciate and love all of us together. And it's that power that can free us. It's that power that's going to free us. It's that power that brought you here today. You didn't come here feeling your wallet and say, well, you know, gee, maybe I can get this dividend. You came here because you are outraged about what's going on. 
You came here because you see our government in free fall. It's like those southern planters that took over those southern legislatures and finally said, well, we just have to secede because we got to keep our money. You're here because you believe in change. And you believe in yourself. And you believe in the ability, as famously Margaret Mead said, a small group of committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, that's all that has. Now, just for the heck of it, let me talk a bit on the positive side of the economic piece anyway. By the way, there really is no need to conserve energy. Because every day we get enough sunlight on this planet, on this country, to take care of a year's worth. So if in fact we had the technology organized, you could have all the cold beer and hot showers that you want. <laughs> you want the thermostat turned up to 78 degrees in your house in the wintertime and turned down to 60 in the summer. Who's going to care if you're using the right technology? But we're using a slave technology. We're using the corrupt economic systems technology, this fossil fuel, which is otherwise known as poison. So we don't have to think about, you know, I, uh, Jimmy Carter, bless him, Mike Dukakis, bless him. You know, they put on sweaters and say, turn on the thermostat. Oh, I'm too far, apparently. <laughs> they put on sweaters and said, turn, on, turn down the thermostat and all that. And that's what we have to do in transition. It makes sense, yes, to conserve now because we're using poison. But we can move to a non-toxic technology. We're on our way to a non-toxic technology. So uh, we don't have to feel that we're going to be deprived. Um, I just want to point out that, do uh, you know who's caught on to this? The Saudis. Yeah. Yeah. The reason the price of oil is as low as it is, I believe, now this is not journalistic fact, in, uh, no, are they here? No. <laughs> this is not journalistic fact, this is my personal opinion. The reason I believe that the Saudis are pumping like crazy is that they know that we're not going to be able to use this stuff much longer. They can produce it, they make money at seven, ten dollars a barrel. And they need to get their cash out, and they actually have a conversion plan for their economy. So if the Saudis, who live by oil, know that this chapter is closing, where are we? You know, what do we have to do? So um, one suggestion, since, since the stuff is poisonous, I think it's outrageous that it's being extracted from our shared land, below cost for that matter. And that at, at the very least, we can stop the extraction of this stuff from our shared land. Not to mention what it does. I don't know if you've been up to Cal outside of Calgary and Alberta and you see what the strip mining, what the Athabasca Sands has done. I don't know if you've seen what can happen out in the West. I don't know if you've noticed what happens to people's water supply when you frack in the neighborhood. But we're trashing the environment in this process. So, time to stop. So, um, I want to thank you for taking this time. Fred and I thought we would uh, have a little bit of fun here uh, to take us out.